You know, I couldn't do a bringing go to the enterprise talk without putting PowerPoint up on the screen. <laughs> so it's dusk, and there's heavy snow falling. A group of rangers is scouting up north of the wall, and they're a little bit scared. There's a heavy frost, and the men are cold, and they're tired. So they decide to break camp, or create a camp. They start up a fire. The men stand around near the fire to get warm. The older ones tell the younger ones horror stories about the crazy, scary things in the woods. A tree branch cracks, and a horse wickers. The men jump to arms, grabbing their swords to defend themselves, but it's too late. White walkers pop out of the shadows and kill all the men. I hope I'm not spoiling anything here. <laughs> that was episode one. Meanwhile, scene change. Back at Winterfell, the entire house of Stark is preparing for King Baratheon's surprise visit. They've got everything in order, they're lined up, but they don't know why the king is coming. Stark is in great shape with the king. There's no reason for him to show up unannounced unless he wants something. The king arrives with all of the pomp and circumstance that kings typically bring with them. But we know that the king didn't travel a thousand miles to just do a little site visit. He's got something in mind. He quickly maneuvers to get Ned alone. Ned! Robert bellows when he finally gets him alone. Times are crazy in Winterfell. I need a hand to the king. I need someone to counsel me, someone to give me guidance and wisdom. I need you to leave Winterfell and come down to King's Landing. Ned Stark says, Sire, I'll do anything you ask of me, but I need you to know that winter is coming. My job is here, up in the north, protecting all of our country from the White Walkers. Winter is coming. How many people in the room know what happened to Ned after that? I won't spoil it. <laughs> it didn't go well, though. So my name is Brian Kettleson, and I'm here to talk to you today about the next wave of developers coming into Go. Much like Ned's dreaded winter, a new wave of developers is coming from the enterprise. I see the fear in your eyes. It's OK. Take a deep breath. Relax. Draw it in. Let it out. It was just a story. An expensive one on HBO, but still <laughs> just a story. So if you've seen Game of Thrones, you know that Ned really had two characteristics. He was known as the good guy. Ned had a conscience. Ned always did the right thing. And he always babbled about winter coming. Winter is coming, winter is coming, winter is coming. You could lose your head for that kind of stuff. Much like Ned, I try to do the right thing most of the time. And I've been babbling about enterprise developers coming for a while, too. For the last year and a half, I've been doing corporate training. And I've been teaching companies, big and small, about how to use Go. Most of the companies have been big. In fact, if you saw Steve Francia's keynote, you saw the big sign that had all of those really large global company names. Fortune 100 companies, Fortune 50 companies, Fortune 5 companies, learning Go, paying little old me to train them in Go. So I'm here today to talk to you about the problems that enterprises are having with Go. Dave Cheney's famous quote, and he says it nearly daily, a rising tide floats all boats. How many people have heard Dave say that? Just a few. He says it every day. You guys need to listen harder. <laughs> nearly every day. The excitement in the air because all of these big enterprises are coming to go, is palpable. 
looking at Mark Bates down here, and he's saying, if IBM is putting Go in production, I'm raising my billing rates. I don't blame him. That's big news, and it's exciting for everyone. But you're not fooling anybody, Mark. Much like Murphy, I have my own law. I made this one up myself, though. For every optimist, there's an equal and opposite pessimist. So what are the pessimists in the crowd thinking? If IBM's doing Go, what does that mean for us? Who here is old enough to remember Java back in 1996, when it first came out, 95, early, early Java? Just a handful. I'm probably one of the oldest people here. It's OK. The gray roots in my purple show. I, I get it. So early Java was really hot stuff. It was amazing. Write once, run anywhere, object-oriented. It was beautiful. It was relatively fast. It was cool. It was exciting. It was new. It was pretty fun. But this guy right over here, he remembers Java when things started to get ugly. Anybody do J2EE? That's what made me quit Java. <laughs> ugly. So something horrible happened, something terrible, something that not even George R.R. R. Martin could have written into a script. Gang of four. Patterns, factories, methods, decorators, facades, proxies, observers, iterators, mediators. Shoot me. <laughs> but you're thinking to yourself, Java used to be awesome. And then the, these people came, and they made it unlovable. You're thinking to yourself, this is hyperbole, Brian. Java really wasn't that bad. And maybe this is just an exception which is a Java joke, did you get that? Maybe this is just an exception, and enterprise developers don't ruin everything when they come. <laughs> right? Now, don't skip ahead. <laughs> don't do that. Seriously, this is just hyperbole, right? The architect says no. You're absolutely right. It wasn't the developer's fault. It was his fault. The architects are the ones that ruin everything. Here Brian goes again with hyperbole. I hear you saying it. I'm not deaf. It's pretty quiet in here. I can hear you saying that. Be quiet. I'm talking. So fine. If Java isn't enough of an example, I'll give you another one. Ruby on Rails, which is a little dark from here, but that's Ruby on Rails if you can't tell. It started as such a beautiful framework. Tiny, tiny little thing. You could generate an app with some scaffolding, whip up some CSS, throw in a little style in there. Next thing you know, you're web 2.0, baby. It was awesome. It was easy. It was beautiful. It was light. It was liberating. Then guess who shows up? The damn architect shows up again. And what does he bring with him? He brings, brings with him a Ruby on Rails that becomes unrecognizable by 2008. That David Heinemeyer Hansen video that everybody saw on YouTube where he made a blog in 15 minutes, unrecognizable within three years because he showed up. Instead of that beautiful, lightweight, and liberating framework, we ended up with patterns. Those patterns, yet again, the quote goes, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. That was George Santayana. What did our architect do? He sprinkled patterns all over my rails, just sprinkling them everywhere. Next thing you know, there's a facade here. There's a factory there. There's presenter decorators. You know, the, the four directory rails app turned into a 20 directory rails app. And I have no clue what they do anymore. The pattern stuck. I'm out of rails. Mic drop. We're out of here. So what used to be fun and free became confused and bloated. Factory methods, presenters, decorators, everywhere. So long, pretty rails. So here's my view of history. 1998, this guy shows up and he screws up Java. 2008, he shows up. He screws up rails. 2018, what's going to happen next? 
It screws up what? Rust. Excellent. Good call. That's an optimist right there. So what is this guy going to do to go? It's really clear to me that we have to do something to, pre to prevent the same fate that happened to Ruby and Java from happening to go. Now, a good war strategist always tries to understand his enemy. So let's just take a moment and understand ours. What does the enemy look like? They're constrained by corporate rules, They're typically very resourceful. They care about their mission and getting it done. They're very good at problem solving, and they usually have very strong domain knowledge. The good news is, for you to be prepared for this enemy, I've found a picture. <laughs> it's a little outdated. 20 years of corporate development, starting at Visual Basic for Applications, VBA. Nobody remembers that? OK. All the way up to C Sharp. And I happen to be BizTalk certified. You can put that in the bank. BizTalk certified, baby. But are corporate developers really our enemy? Of course they're not. Corporate developers kiss their kids. They brush and floss their teeth. Just like you and me. They love their jobs. Often the only difference between a corporate developer and an open source developer or a startup developer are the constraints that their company puts on them to get their job done. Let's explore some of those. So with corporate development, VCS isn't always a choice. I have a good story about this that I won't share because it ended up with tears. But I can tell you that doing Ruby on Rails using Team Foundation Server, not going to happen. Not going to happen. So instead, I put up a pirate subversion server in my company. And it eventually got caught and shut down. Corporate developers have to deal with proxies. They have standardized development environments. Now, how many times have you started a new gig and they just throw you a MacBook and say, here's the keys to the GitHub repository. Let's get busy. That's, that's our lives in the corporate world, or in the uh, open source world. But in a corporate world, you get a corporate issued laptop with a corporate issued image that has a corporate issued development environment. Half the time it's in Windows or more. And the choices for that development environment aren't made by you. They're made by the architect. So if you're like me, you're looking at this and thinking, that glass is half empty. Things are going downhill fast. It's going to start to get ugly in Goville. But why don't we swap our hats for just a moment and think about what would happen if we prepared for this non-enemy by cleaning up our house a little bit. Got a little excited there. So if we clean up our house a little bit, if we prepare for them, maybe things won't go as badly for Go as they did for Ruby and Java. So in the last year and a half, I came up with this list of problems for corporate developers. And this isn't a list of all of corporate developers' problems. This is a list of development problems specific to Go in the corporate world. These are problems that when I show up on site to train, people say, how in the world do you ship an app without proper dependency management? And I say, <clears throat> glide. Uh, I don't know. We don't have a standard solution. Um, clone everything. Fork it. I don't know. They say, well, there isn't even tooling built into Go to handle semantic versioning. How do you know what version of apps you're using? I say, oh, well, we open source developers. We just run on master. I mean, what could go wrong? Let's ship it, right? We've got a CI pipeline. We roll it back. And then the last thing they ask for is enterprise in integrations. How do we connect Go to SAP? Um, REST? I, d I don't know. Does Go have a good Oracle driver? God, I hope not. <laughs> so let's break these down one at a time. Let's start with dependency management. So really? Do we have to be here? Do we have to be talking about dependency management yet again? Go is now eight years old, 2009. It's been around for a while. 
Dependency management should not be an issue at this point. We want dependency management so we can have repeatable builds. We need stability. I even put it in there twice. Repeatable builds. That's a kind of a visual pun. <laughs> but explicit declaration of your dependency versions gives you those repeatable builds. So dependency management is a core critical issue to enterprises. There are companies that actually archive and stamp the code that goes to each production release. If you have a financial services company in the United States of America and you need to be SOX compliant, then every release of any piece of source code gets copied out, not just tagged, but copied out into a folder somewhere, locked down. This is the source code that was in production on Tuesday. Every release gets copied down. Without explicit dependency declaration, that isn't something you can do after the fact. That's something that has to be done with a cut and paste or a, a clone of a directory. So where do we stand with Go? We're awfully close with Dep. Sam and his team have been working really hard. It's looking good. It mostly works. I haven't personally run into any bugs with Go. I know a few people have, or with Dep, but I know a few people have. But Dep is hamstrung by the lack of version projects. Is that red readable? It really doesn't look like it is here. No, my bad. So this says hamstrung by lack of versioned projects. And it's in red for emphasis, not de-emphasis. <laughs> what happens if we don't fix versioning? Not a problem. He's coming. He'll fix it. He's done it before. <laughs> right? Maven? Who likes Maven? Raise your, raise your hands. Give me a big round of applause if you love Maven. <laughs> Out. <laughs> they tried to fix it with Gradle. OK. Ant? Yeah. Mark Bates, XML, baby. You know you love it. XML for the win. Ivy? No. Sorry. So what can you do to fix this problem? You can use DEP. Try it on your projects today. Use DEP. Use DEP. File bug reports if you have them. You can contribute to DEP. There's a lot of open issues. Find an issue that suits your particular problems. Fix it. Take an evening. Write a bug report. You can explicitly declare your dependencies. And I'll repeat this one more time, because I have that American English. Add DEP to your projects. Now, DEP. Was that too much? Did I drill that in enough? Just a little bit? All right, second problem, semantic versioning. So what is semantic versioning? It's a way to describe the versions of your projects with numbers that mean something, semantic versions. There's generally three numbers. The major version number, that means incompatible API changes. You go from version 1.0.0 to version 2.0.0, that's an API break. We change something drastic. A minor version, that's a feature that's been added, but in a backward compatible way. All your existing code should work, but we added some new stuff. 1.0 to 1.1, we added features. And then the last version, 1.1.1, that last one is a patch release. We fixed something, we didn't break anything anywhere, we didn't add new features, we just fixed a thing. Major, minor patch. It's not the only versioning option we have. There are lots of other versioning schemes, but this one is the most popular and it's the most highly adopted. So if we're gonna get behind a standard, I think we should pick this one. Let's get behind semantic versioning for Go. What happens when we have no versions? It's the wild, wild west. Cowboys and Indians, buffalo running off cliffs. It's insanity. Insanity is not the place we want to be developing. It's a non-starter, not just for the enterprise, but it should be a non-starter everywhere else, too. If you've released code, and I'm going to raise my hand here because I have never tagged one of my projects once, ever. Bad Brian. If you release code without versioning, you're giving yourself and anybody else who uses that software problems in the future. 
you might as well just put a free coupon for Excedrin on your open source page because the headaches are coming. So what can you do? You can start tagging your projects. What's a tag? Tag is a frozen point of time. This is an assigned version. I say that at this moment, at this git commit, this is version 1.0.0. We have reached 1.0. This is ready to ship. So I tag that and say, this is version 1.0. Now anybody who wants to go get version 1.0 of my project always gets the exact same version because it's tagged. It points to a point in time. If you follow semantic version guidelines to determine which piece of your version to increment, then all of the tools like DEP will work beautifully because DEP allows you to declare a version dependency based on ranges. So you can say any version of Brian's project that's 1.1 up to 2.0. So you can have ranges. As long as I follow semantic versioning, I don't take away functionality or break the API, then DEP will continue to resolve dependencies even as I add new features to my project, as long as I don't break compatibility with the API. And then the last thing that you can do, or you can recommend that others do, is build semantic version understanding into the Go tool chain. Go is probably the only new language that's been released in the last 10 years that does not specifically inherently understand any versioning. None. Rust has crates. They're built in. They understand semantic versions. Pony, Crystal, Nim. Nim has semantic versioning. Does Go? Shame. So what is a tag? What really is a tag? How do you make one? So there's two kinds of tags. There's annotated tags and lightweight tags. For the purposes of tagging your applications, it doesn't matter which you use. The difference between the two is that an annotated tag has extra information, like a message. When you tag with an annotation, you can say, this is release 2.0, it has all of these features. If you tag without an annotation, it's just called version 2.0.0. Either way, you're tagged, and that's a good thing. Lightweight tags just point to a specific commit with less information. Like I said before, I don't care what you use. Annotated or lightweight, they're both tags. So let's do a git tag demo. If you're like me, which I hope isn't the case, let's go here, then tagging is a little bit new to you. Is that visible? It isn't visible. Hang on. We have to do the screen sharing dance. Remind me to go undo this later. That's Windows, by the way. It's good for the soul. All right, so I mentioned previously, I have never once tagged any of my open source. And I do feel shame about that. Now that I've been out in the real world and I see the pain involved in it, so I went out and taught myself what tags are. So if you have a project and you type git tags, you, oh, what, no git? <laughs> Windows. <laughs> there we go. So I just had an extra character in there that wasn't visible somewhere. So if you type git tag, it gives you a list of the tags that are available in your project. These are versions of your project at a point in time that have been tagged. To create a tag, you type git tag, and then give it a version number, 0.0.1.2. I've tagged it. It's done. So whatever code was at master, well, let's not fall for that one again. So whatever code was at master just got tagged version 0.0.2. .0 Look at that. I just changed too many years of development bad habits by creating a tag. The problem with this, though, is that the tag only exists locally. We have to push it back up to 
GitHub, otherwise the tag never happened. So if we do git push origin version 0.0.2, .0 now that tag goes up to GitHub, and at that point in time, our tag is created. So let's go to github.com, P. Kettleson, which project was that? Gen kit. We better have Wi-Fi or we're in trouble. We can do it. Whew. And now GitHub shows that I have two releases. They both have the same date because the date is the date of the last commit to this project. So I've got version 0.0.1 and version 0.0.2. They both point to the same point in time, the same git commit. And you can see that because the short version of the git SHA is right here, A79C43D. So if we do a git history or git log, we can see that that last commit, A79C43D, is the commit that got tagged. So that's git tags. You now have no excuse. You can't claim ignorance for tagging your projects. Pull my glasses down like this and look like that hand on the hip. Chicken wings. That's what my kids call it. Are you busting out the chicken wings on me, Dad? Yes, I am. All right, let me unshare the screen thing here. Anybody remember where we were? <laughs> it's a little joke, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Would have been a lot worse if it was Linux. So the third thing that I want to bring up as a problem with corporate adoption of Go is enterprise integrations. And you may laugh and think, why do I care about SAP or Oracle? But it's a true hindrance to corporations adopting Go. So let's talk about these enterprise integrations. What are the kinds of things that are missing from Go? Active Directory bindings, LDAP. Identity, SSO, customer relationship management, business intelligence, billing and accounting, business process management, enterprise resource planning, supply chain management. Now I'm going to let you in on a corporate secret. Almost all of these have a three-letter acronym. BPM, SCM, ERP, <laughs> CRM. There's a lot of three-letter acronyms in the corporate world. A lot of them. But why do you care? Why do you care if we can get to Siebel or Oracle? You care because newcomers, when they come to Go, they're going to bring their old paradigms with them. Or they will adopt the paradigms they see. And the software that people start with when they pick up a language is that same paradigm that shapes how they use that new language for a long time before they have to unlearn those bad patterns. The existing packages, if there are any for these kinds of systems, are half done, they're broken, they don't have tests, but more importantly, they look like C-sharp or Java. Have you ever seen Go code that looks like C-sharp and Java? Seen a lot of it? It's really scary. Mark someday will tell you about the people that, that built Try, Catch, and Finally into Go at one of his trainings. And that's just wrong, <laughs> wrong. So the last problem with enterprise integrations is that it's really hard to find Go packages now. If you come into Go and you say, OK, I need a, a, a way to bind to LDAP, you go to GitHub, you type Golang LDAP. That first one looks fine. Is it good Go code? I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing in Go. How do we know it's good? 
So we need a way to sort packages and discover packages that are higher quality. So what can you do? You. What can you do? If you happen to write some enterprise integration code, write it well and open source it so that when new developers come to Go, they can say, oh, look, there's an LDAP package. It's got tests in it and interfaces. Maybe that's how I should write my code. So if you have an enterprise integration project, open source it, please. And then another thing that we can do is we can collect all of that enterprise integration software into a single GitHub org. Let's make a place where the SCM adapters and the ORM adapters and the QRS and the LMNOP adapters are all in one spot so they're easy to find. So to recap, the onslaught is coming. Winter is here. Enterprise developers aren't white walkers. They're not going to kill you. But we have a choice. We can welcome them and we can help them become gophers or they can bring the architect in and they can help us become Java developers. We get to choose. So I have a call to action. That's a CTA in corporate terms, call to action. It's on a PowerPoint deck. I've got a deck for that. Our call to action is to use DEP. Exercise DEP's edge cases. File bugs in DEP. And find ways to build dependency management into all of our Go tools, into the Go tool chain itself. Dependency management and dependencies in general should be first-class citizens in Go, not secondary concerns. For semantic versioning, learn the Semver rules. Major, minor, patch. What does each one mean? Major is a breaking API. Minor is an addition to the API that doesn't break backwards compatibility. And patch is a fix with no new code, no new additions. So you can make releases. You can become the anti-Brian. You can tag your releases. Push those tags up to GitHub so that we have a known good state for a release of software. I hereby solemnly swear I'm going to start tagging things. Solemnly. I hope. For enterprise integrations, if you build enterprise integration code, share it. Open source it. Create idiomatic packages. More important than anything else, build good documentation. The thing that shocked me the most when I started at Microsoft a few weeks ago was that they care less about everything else and more about documentation at Microsoft. Developers need documentation. They need to understand what this package is going to do. They need to understand the proper way to use it. Documentation takes a poor project and makes it a great project. And great projects that don't have documentation are unusable by people who can't read the source code or can't be bothered to spend a weekend plumbing through Kubernetes to find out where that network adapter gets attached. And I'm not picking on Kubernetes. It has great documentation. But if it didn't, how would you know how to use it? So create documentation that is a match for the quality of users that you expect. And then last, make your enterprise integration code easy to find. So this isn't one of those presentations where I stand up here and lecture you. OK, so the first half of this was a presentation where I stand up here and lecture you. But I'm not that guy. I'm a guy who believes in taking action. Put your money where your mouth is. So today, I have a few announcements. I'm going to introduce a tool called Rock. Rock is a command line application that helps you tag your projects. So even somebody like me can tag my projects to release them. It's opinionated, because all good software should be opinionated, and it only understands semantic versioning. So let's do a demo of demos. Channeling my inner Kelsey Hightower. All right, so a little hard to see. Make it a little bigger. Which rock? It's in my go path slash bin. 
So I've got gen kit. Let's look at our tags. I've got three of them. So if I type rock help, tells me that I can call the tags subcommand to view or add semantic version tags to a project. So let's do that. Let's do rock tags. Existing tags, two of them. So the tags that I added earlier, way down at the bottom of the screen there, version 001 and 002, those tags are already understood by Rock. But if it's time to add a new version, then we can use Rock to do that too. So let's say Rock tag, and then we've got flags for major, minor, and patch. So let's do a major tag, Rock tag dash M. So with a major tag, we increment the major number and reset the others to zero. And it pushed it to GitHub for me. So there's no excuse for not understanding all the intricacies of Git. Rock tag major. We just had a major release. And it's pushed to GitHub. So let's go up to the GitHub repository and make sure that my money really is where my mouth is. And now we've got a version 1.0. <laughs> But that's not all. You guys don't have Billy Mays over here, did you? No? The best crazy ass commercial guy in the United States. His name was Billy Mays, and he did those half hour long commercials where it looks like they're trying to not really sell you, but sell you, and he just was loud. But wait, there's more. That's what I'm here for today. But wait, there's more. So let's start up a server, because there's nothing I love better than a server. And this is one that Mark Bates happened to write for me yesterday. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate that. Because I had big ambitions for this talk and uh, not so much time. So with this server running, now if we type rock dash help, help. See, there's another command in there, search. What can we do with that? Rock. Search dash author. It's a little slow. It's running on a tiny little GPS. I promise I'll make it production ready soon. So using the rock search command, it searches through the metadata of the Go packages that it knows about and returns repositories that match that. So we can search by author name and see all of Mark's information, or we can search by keyword. So let's search for keyword of channels. What does it find? Matt Rye or Vice? Anybody played with Vice yet? Slick stuff. Definitely recommend playing with Vice. So using Rock, we can both tag our repositories with semantic versioning, and we can discover new and exciting packages to work with. Good? Bad? OK. All right. I was hoping for more excitement, but I'll take this. So not only does Rock have a command line component, which is open sourced and released as of today at github.com slash package rock. You can go get github.com slash package rock right now and start tagging your projects. Please do tag your projects. With or without rock, tag your projects. But there is also a web server, and that isn't done or baked well yet at all. Rocks web. There we go. There's a web server written in Buffalo, of course, as all good Go web apps should be written. And we have big plans for Rocks web. So the idea is that you can search all of the Go packages that are available everywhere. You can search for them by license, search for them by keywords, search for them by authors. But more importantly, we want to be able to enable you to find high quality packages haven't really figured out what the definition of high quality is yet. So I'm open to ideas on that. You know, is the definition of high quality a Go Meta Linter score of some sort? Is it the number of stars on GitHub? Is it some other thing? Is it a composite of all of that? I don't know. Open up an issue and, and give me an idea on what a good quality Go package looks like. 
Is it the ratio of test code to regular code? I don't know. I think it should be some of all of that, perhaps, but not just one of those things. So I'm curious to, think, to, to know what you think about how to determine a good quality package from a poor quality package. And it's not just because Matt wrote it. There's got to be another indicator somehow, because that's just not fair. All right, let's undo my screen mess. Maybe we don't need to. I hear those heavy sighs out there. We're almost done. I did the demo. Relax. Damn it, I did it again. Yes. All right, so that was the demo. But there's one more thing. I created a new GitHub organization called Enterprise Kit. And my challenge to you is that any time you create an enterprise integration, whether it's LDAP or any other of those three-letter acronyms, that you create a pull request or open an issue in Enterprise Kit, and we'll get it added there so that there's a good place for corporate developers to come and find high-quality software. We've got GoKit for microservices, and it's amazing. It's full of great composable pieces. Let's do the same thing for the enterprise. Let's clean up our house and make things ready for them so that they don't bring that architect in. We don't want him. So you've got a choice. The corporate developers are coming. You can have the handsome guy on the left or the guy on the right. Either way, they're coming. So we can make our house ready for them, or we can have them come and reorganize things a little bit. You can embrace DEP and start managing your versions well. You can tag your code with semantic version tags. And you can help build enterprise integrations that are high quality and open source. So that new developers, when they come to Go, have an idiomatic way to learn Go, rather than learning Go that looks like C Sharp or learning Go that looks like Java. If you've enjoyed this conference, I want you to let the organizers know how much you've enjoyed it. I want you to go home and tell your coworkers and your peers and your friends how much you enjoyed it and come back next year. Let's give the organizers and all the speakers a great big round of applause. <clears throat> I'm grateful that you listened to me rant for this long. Thank you for having me. That's all I have.